Ay, ay, ay. Hello, welcome, um, friends and neighbours. This is Faisal Hassan, your member provincial parliament for York Southwestern. Tonight we have a virtual town hall meeting on long-term care, and I have a special guest here tonight. Before I start, um, I wish to acknowledge at this time the land that we now know as York Southwestern is a traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishabe, the Chekwe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuitsum and Metis people. Hello and welcome. You're joining us live, Faisal Hassan, NDP. And thank you for joining us this evening, this important discussion. Too many families have been devastated by the unexpected loss of loved ones in this pandemic. Through the efforts of the Canadian Armed Forces, families learned of the, of the terrible conditions that many of our elders were forced to endure. Despite the reassurances, the government's promise of an iron ring never materialized. Instead, we witnessed a penny-pinching approach that continues to this day. Tonight, I am excited to be joined by my colleague and the official opposition critic for long-term care, Member Provincial Parliament, Theresa Armstrong of London Fernshaw. I'm also joined by Paula Randanza, President of HOPE, a local 2,220, who represents long-term care and the retirement home workers across Ontario. Our party has a plan. There's a path out of the neglect of previous liberal and conservative governments, one that makes long-term care, sets minimum standards for hands-on care, and honors and respects them, the professionalism of our province's personal support workers. Welcome again, uh, friends and neighbors, and uh, I would like to welcome my guest. First, I would like to uh, um, welcome uh, Theresa Armstrong, a member of the provincial parliament uh, for uh, London Fonsham. Welcome, Theresa. Thank you so much, uh, Faisal, for having me this evening um, on this very important long-term long care town hall meeting. And uh, welcome to Paula and all your guests um, out there in virtual world. Um, as we are, you know, more and more ingrained in what we are doing during the pandemic, this is such an important forum for us to all meet and discuss what's happening um, in long-term care. So I just want to go a uh, over some of the things that um, I've been noticing and what's happening in the province. So right now, the state, state uh, of long-term care province-wide, there are over 3,400 residents that have died. And as of just as of yesterday, um, it was 24. So uh, residents that died. And the numbers just keep going um, you know, higher and higher. Instead of acting quickly, this government chooses to downplay the humanitarian crisis, but we know that staff are at their limit. They're exhausted. Uh, they've been working so long uh, for so many hours uh, through this pandemic that we know that they are stretched to the limit. Families are worried and residents are scared. Um, just recently, I did a, a phone interview, a radio interview this morning about Roberta Place in Barrie. It has the UK variant and it has made its way into the home and it's devastating effects. And as, as far as the government, there's been no new measures that have been announced to mitigate the spread of this variant um, that's known to be more aggressive. And according to uh, recent reporting, Minister Inspe the ministry's inspectors uh, went into the home as recently as earlier in December and, um, uh, and earlier in January and reported significant failings to safeguard staff and residents, and yet the ministry has still chosen not to intervene. And uh, so far in the long-term care, we have lost 11 staff. And over the weekend uh, in London here, we lost Yasin Deba, a 19-year-old um, long-term care worker, a young man who came to this country with his family in search of a better life. And uh, the system really takes advantage of racialized folks, particularly women uh, who are overworking, overworked and underpaid in the long-term care system. 
And so to overcome this crisis, what do we really urgently need is we need routine surveillance and testing for staff and residents. Vaccinations uh, by the end of this week should have been in long-term care homes. And now we've heard there was numbers mixed up today. We needed to make sure that government took a real step forward to hire new staff. And we needed new staff long before phase one, but they haven't even accomplished that yet. And we're into phase two. And of course, the inspections that they have, uh, we need them with teeth that can actually be enforced and paid sick days. And this is all the while that the Ford government sits on billions of dollars. But what the NDP has been doing is that we've looked at the system before and we've always proposed changes, but we're also looking to build a better system overall. And we're looking beyond this crisis and the way we wanna see seniors care in the province, it should be, we should be able to age with dignity, which means home care investments to stay home longer, 4.1 hours of care per resident per day, enshrined caregiver rights, an office dedicated to seniors and their growing needs, like a seniors advocate, and the removal of profit from care, which is very important. Now we have the, um, the doctors uh, on side calling for that as well. And accountability for homes that fail to meet standards, as well as yearly um, reporting on assessed needs of the population to inform future investments. It's so important that that happens so we can see what the statistics are like. We can see where the population is growing in the seniors uh, file and make sure we accommodate date that. So simply, the system is broken. It doesn't provide quality of care and it's not economically sound. And Time to Care is a bill that I introduced um, on February 5th. It'll be 100 days since my bill, Time to Care, passed second reading. And since then, another amount announced, uh, another other than announcing that they are actually going to commit to those four hours of care um, the, and pass my bill, the government has decided that they're going to have an average of four hours of care by 2025. And the Ford government hasn't made any moves to make it a reality. And there's no investments in the recent budget. There's not a hiring spree. And there's no mechanisms to hold homes accountable when they fail to provide that minimum. So we really need to have 4.1 hours of uh, hours in the legisla in legislation, and we need it now. Now I can say that Mike Harris, when he was uh, back in the day, 2003, and subsequent governments since then have failed to re-legislate it. So what we've seen is we've seen uh, that there's been no legislation to hold, especially for profits accountable. So I. I uh, mentioned this a lot and um, I want everyone to join me if possible on February 5th and use the hashtag uh, time to care to remind them to remind them of their promise to bring back the legislative minimum standard. Um, and I, I'll quickly touch on what's happening in London. In London, the state of long term care, we've been fairly lucky. Uh, we have not had major outbreak outbreaks in long-term care, but I still have constituents calling me about concerns of long-term care. They've called me prior to the pandemic years before, and uh, most recently they're still calling because they, they actually shared that you know, their parent was left in a room with someone who tested COVID positive when, when their loved one wasn't COVID positive. They contacted me unsure of whether to bring their parent home or not. And they contacted me about the inconsistency of this uh, visitor's rights across the home. And the list goes on about what was happening during the, during the pandemic that people brought concerns forward. Um, so last week, I also uh, was made aware that due to a short supply of vaccines in London, the uh, ministry, or excuse me, the Middlesex London Health Unit was forced to have to make decisions and prioritize which long-term care residents would be vaccinated and which ones wouldn't. Because that, what that meant was they had, to, if someone had uh, COVID previously, they weren't going to get vaccinated. And long-term care residents should always have been their number one priority for vaccination. But this government chooses um, to prioritize speed over precision when it comes to seniors. So that that's a little bit of where we're at on uh, on the long-term care file from my perspective. And I know there's so much more work to do. So um, I thank you, Faisal, for having me. And I look forward to the conversation this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. And I'm so proud of the work you're doing at Queen's Park. And I'm so proud to support Time to Care Act. And folks, remember, February 5th, Time to Care Act. 
make sure we demand the government legislates it, and we needed it now. I now turn to Paula Randanso, president of Pope Local 2220, who represents and care and uh, res uh, retirement homes across Ontario. Welcome, Paula. Thank you. Thank you uh, for having me. Uh, I, I do want to, it's, it's, you know, I was asked to sort of present some of the issues that are, are facing long-term care and retirement employees and, and agency staff, because I also represent um, some uh, women and men that work uh, for agency uh, community care homes. You know, and, and to narrow the issues is a very difficult thing because there is so many issues. Uh, but I do want to just touch on just two quickly, two two different parts. One part is, of course, this pandemic has been horrible and it is um, terribly, terribly stressful. And as Teresa outlined, all of the um, horrific uh, conditions that have happened to both residents and and staff and and you have to broaden that to their families and uh, to their loved ones. Uh, one of the things that's been very frustrating for those of us working in the in the labor movement and working in the sector for, um, in my case, it's been over 25 years, is that this is not this didn't happen because there's a pandemic. This did not happen. This has happened because we've had over 20 years of conservative and liberal governments. The liberals had this file for 15 years. And uh, these conditions have got worse and worse and worse with, of course, Doug Ford making it that and his government that much worse. You know, the working short didn't happen uh, a year ago. The working short started, you know, close to a decade ago. And staff have been, it's not just begging for more time to do more care for residents, which is essential. But even if we got the four hours tomorrow, which we want, there's not staff to do it. Like who's going to be doing the work? Right. You know, under the last 15 years under the Liberals uh, government, uh, we saw the, the decrease from full-time jobs to part-time jobs to the point where in for-profit care, it's reported to close to 20% lower staffing levels in for-profit care. So you start a pandemic, you've already got 20% less staff, then some of the staff have to leave because they have to take care of their children. Some of the staff leave because they're sick. Some of the staff leave because they are, have uh, immune systems that will are, are threatened. And some of them are 65 to 70 years old, some of the staff. So they had to go home. So now you have no staff. Add to that burden, that has been al blindly allowed to happen. We have people who earn 30 hours bi-weekly, which means they don't have a full-time job. So they're all working two and three jobs. And when those two and three jobs, uh, because they're working two and three jobs, if one person calls in sick, there's no one to replace them because they're working in another workplace. Uh, in an, in, uh, and, by, and then the pandemic hits, and now you've got a person working in three workplaces, taking public transit and going from one workplace to another, uh, which just added to the acceleration of the, of the pandemic in the first place. So on top of that, because they're all part-time, none of them have sick leave, none of them have benefits. So they're working full-time hours in two and three jobs with no benefits, no sick time. So when they're sick, they have to come to work because they have no money. So again, we have a pandemic hit. We've got people working in two and three workplaces, going to work sick because they have to, uh, to feed their families. And it has brought us to this point where we are now in an, have an industry, because that's what it is. It's an industry now, a for-profit industry, where you have a 78% higher risk of dying if you live in a for-profit long-term care. And I am, I'm emboldened by the fact that we are now talking about it. You know, 10, for over the last 15 years, I have begged reporters from the CBC, the Toronto Star, the Globe and Mail to do stories about the conditions in long-term care. And everybody knows them now, but they didn't want to do them because they weren't big enough stories in their minds. It wasn't big enough to talk about how 
horrible it was for the workers working short and working part time and working without sick time. They weren't really interested because nobody died yet. Not enough people had died yet. So now at least we have that attention. And I think that that is a, one of the positives, if you can, there's not many positives, but that is a positive. We have a dialogue going now. And I think, and then I'll leave it to questions that for other, for the, for the audience to ask. But I really think it's important that we don't not just, that we not forget what's happening, but we can't forget how we got here, how we keep going back to governments that um, accept huge, huge donations from these for-profit corporations, and they do not put the changes in place. I really thought at the beginning of this pandemic, this would force real changes in staffing and in uh, oversight and in, in the whole uh, issue of profits uh, over people. Well, our members are fighting and struggling. Right now, we are literally taking Chartwell Care to, um, before the Ministry of Labor, because they're refusing N95 masks, and it's been it's been regulated by the Ministry of Long Term Care. So what well, we're fighting for an N95 mask in a in a home with outbreak, Chartwell Care, Sienna Care, Extenda Care are all paying out millions of dollars in uh, profits, millions and millions and millions of dollars in profits to their shareholders, and we can't let that happen anymore. And I'm really urging all of the participants on this uh, watching today uh, to, to not just take away the answers that you hopefully will get from the panel tonight, but also to look at what we're going to do in the future to keep this dialogue going, to keep the pressure not just on this government, because uh, I'm hoping this government will go, um, but to make sure that whatever government we elect, and I uh, I do hope it's an NDP government, but whatever government we elect, that we have to hold them to a higher standard, which, and that standard has to, to include uh, stopping for-profit long-term care. It, it should not be, people's lives should not be pro for profit. So I, I'm gonna leave it there. I am going to make sure that our members are well aware, Teresa, of February 5th uh, for the hashtag and on Facebook and whatever other ways we, we can communicate that out um, and I and we'll be watching because it as I said it's very important for us to get more time for our residents I just hope with that more time which is a small step and it's not even enough time really at the grand scheme of things but it's a start uh, that there is some plan that our government will have to staff to make sure there's staff there and that the same poor employees right now who are working short are now going to not be expected to do that much more without help. Anyway, I really do appreciate Faisal have, uh, you having me on uh, and giving us uh, a voice to be able to talk about this really, really very stressful and important, important uh, sector. And I, I do want to say on behalf of the, of the members of Local uh, 2220 that over 10% of our members are sick now or have been sick over 10%. And that's a high numbers. And we have had uh, one employee, one member pass away. And that was tragic. And I, I want to say that we are all looking and watching uh, and waiting for our government to step up and start do like they've, you know, I don't know how we put the genie back in the bottle at this point in this mm -hmm. pandemic. They were so slow to do the to shutdowns. It was slow, slow, slow. Not only was it slow to close schools again, it was a terrible rollout of the education system. Our children were at risk. Our teachers are at risk. Um, so I'm just hoping on behalf of all of our members that, that we can continue this dialogue until we actually have real change. Thank you. Well, thank you, Paula. Thank you. And I fully agree with you. There's no money to make on the backs of our seniors. And we know that the Conservatives and the Liberals built a system where big private corporations warehouse seniors and institutionalized like facilities. They cut corners when it comes to staffing and care in order to pocket big profits. And now I uh, 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 will turn to you. Uh, there are those of you who are joining us live, Faisal Hassan, NDP, uh, we'll try to add your comments. But first we'll start with those who have already registered questions and then we will come to your comments later. Stay tuned and get engaged with your discussions We'll be able to include your comments 
We'll be able to also include your questions, but uh, since we have also asked folks uh, to register earlier questions, we'll start with them first and foremost, and then I'll come to you next term. Um, the first question comes from uh, Kale Blaze and says, hi Faisal and Paula. Thanks for taking my question. I live in Barry and I can actually see Roberta Place long-term care home from my bedroom window. Is there anything that people can do, help the people and staff to get through in the near term? And in the long term, what can we do to ensure that something like this doesn't happen again? Thanks. So uh, should we start with Paula then there? Hi, and thank you for that question. I think um, it's a very difficult question because of course, how, how, do you, how, how do you support people who are basically locked down inside their workplace? Mm -hmm. But I do know from my own members, they truly do appreciate when the community does parades uh, by their building with signs and you know balloons, whatever, uh, to show your appreciation. They certainly um, appreciate having treats sent into the building, although you have to call to make sure it's done in a safe and infection control manner. They, um, so I, I do think that those are small things you, that you can do. And then of course, in the long run, I think I spoke to that already from my perspective, the way to fix this. And by the way, retirement homes aren't even governed by the Ministry of Long-Term Care and Health. They're governed by the Ministry of Housing. So they don't even have the same, like if we think long-term care has uh, weak uh, rules and overseers, retirement has almost none. So that is a really big issue that I would strongly urge um, the NDP, the official opposition to be really pushing on is the changes to those licensing um, acts or uh, in legislation that allows anybody to open up a retirement home. And um, I think we've seen some of the worst tragedies in retirement homes, much worse than long-term care. And I think that that legislation has to happen, that governance has to change. So I'll, I'll right. leave it there on this. Thank you. And I'll turn to Teresa, if you would add uh, anything there. On the mic, Teresa, we can't hear you. Yeah. Your mic is, yeah. Trying to manage my beagle there earlier, so I apologize for that. No um, my support team, <laughs> my family isn't here uh, to help me with that. So um, I think it's really heartwarming to see that the public is shoring up uh, the support for the workers in these long-term care homes. And Roberta Place is just one of the ones that's been an example of how things have gotten out of control. Um, under phase one, we allowed, you know, Pop Cajun was the first, if everybody remembers that first home that started having so many uh, outbreaks and people dying and um, horrible, horrible, horrible outcomes. What did we learn from that is very little. Now we have been seeing outbreaks and deaths and Roberta Place is in need of help urgently. I think there's about 137 beds and I, I, the last number I got was 120 residents were infected. And there were 49 deaths as of this morning in Roberta Place. We are calling on the government to send in Canadian Armed Forces, send in the Red Cross. I mean, the workers can't do it all when there's 120 uh, residents infected. They're exhausted. But how we can support that is call your MPP in Barrie. And say to the, and and leave a message and say, look, what are you doing about Roberta Place? You got to help the staff and the residents there. Families are worried, and so doing that, call that representative in Barry, get them moving, um, and and pushing them to to speak out and speak to that to minister and the premier um, about getting reinforcements in Roberta Place. But as Paula said, you know, you know, even a letter campaign to those workers and those people, um, the residents in, in long term care at Roberta Place, some words of encouragement um, would be go, go a long way for them. But ultimately, these, we shouldn't be spending our energy in how to um, support 
a, a long-term care home that's a for-profit home, by the way, who is um, not looked after the workers when they're fighting for N95 masks, um, who have don't have the proper infection controls in, what we should be doing is passing legislation and making all long-term care homes not for profit so that every dollar, every public dollar is publicly delivered. And that during a pandemic, we don't have, uh, you know, shareholders collecting dividends, millions and millions of dollars, while our loved ones in long-term care, while the workers in long-term care are being infected and running, uh, you know, on fumes, providing that care to the people in, in to our loved ones in long-term care. So, I, I thank you uh, very much for wanting to help and absolutely do those, those acts of kindness. But ultimately, these things can't keep perpetuating. Governments need, I think people would have more respect for a government that actually admits that there's a problem and that puts in uh, proper fixes that are going to be uh, light changing into the future. Just not for now, but going into the future. And that's what I, um, I, I want to say is what an NDP government is doing. We have our seniors care plan out and it talks about those fixes um, that are needed, that need to be cemented and rooted in long-term care. So we don't have to come back here again. You know, the pandemic has thrown over the covers of the horrif horrifying things that were always happening in long-term care. I mean, there's been lawsuits, uh, class action lawsuits before the pandemic that's been happening, but no one's paid attention. And as Paula said, like what, what number does it take before a government acts? You know, even now we're seeing the numbers and, the, and those numbers are people's lives. And the government is still, still slow to act when it comes to Roberta Place in this example and sending in reinforcements and help to help those residents and help those, those workers and put the minds of families to, at ease that, to knowing that they're doing everything they can to keep their loved ones safe. Well, thank you, Paula and uh, Teresa. And you know, the Conservatives and the Liberals before them uh, cut inspections, they cut funding, they froze in badges and they blocked public inquiries. We also needed to get the bottom of this. Uh, but actually we have called for independent inquiry so that we learn every story so that we can fix it. And we need to do that. And prior to the pandemic, we had all heard about heartbreaking stories of seniors dehydrated, injured without explanation, left to develop uh, bed sores and not given a uh, support um, that they need uh, or help uh, to eat, you know, or dress them, bath them, or even get to the bathroom. So we know this story, but an NDP government will fix it. Um, no, I have to say to your point, Faisal saying a public inquiry, when we called that during the wet law for, you know, horrible uh, murders, we called for that. And at that time, the Liberals denied our request for a public inquiry into a phase two, into what we said were systemic uh, problems, right? And those systemic problems are now rearing their ugly head. And again, fast forward to the Conservatives, we asked for a public inquiry into the, you know, the dealings of the pandemic, and they ended up uh, creating a government commission. Now, luckily, that government commission is calling on the same things that we have been calling on, which is the four hours of care, right? Better wages for PS, uh, PSWs and workers, all workers in long-term care. So um, thank you for reminding us about the public inquiry. Thank you. And uh, those of you who are joining us live, uh, you're joining Faisal Hassan, NDP. I will, I know that you've got so many comments. We'll turn them, but I'll just maybe rotate the comments and the questions. I'll just uh, read your comment before your questions. Quickly, Frank says, agree, Teresa. Well said, an, an, an ounce of uh, prevention, it was a pound of care, cure. And then also Steve says, uh, union is strong. And, um, and, uh, definitely, and Joel says, uh, Faisal Hassan, Andrew Horvath for Premier 2022. And the comments continues, but I'll just continue um, uh, taking those folks who have registered for their questions. And I think the next question comes from Lina Vanicia. Says, please justify to me how our senior residents who worked hard to help build our city, now in our long-term care facilities, are eating miserably on only $8.33 a day. That is $1.40 less than what our Ontario prisoners are eating on $9.73 a day. How is this justified? And then follow up a long question, but says again, 
explain and tell me why this amount has not been increased to match that of a prisoner. Please also explain how the nourishment of senior elderly is weighted below that of a convicted criminal and deemed to not require uh, uh, equal or more than a prisoner per day. And continues to say, uh, shame on all those who are responsible for this. It is a belling I have witnessed firsthand with relatives and friends in these homes who express their views, however, timidly for fear of repercussion to the facilities where they live. Now concludes, when will this government put forth the respect and value our elderly deserve and make this increase? This is from Lina Peniccia. And I will ask uh, maybe um, um, Teresa to comment. And he's talking about um, residents, the neglect, uh, the systemic issues and how we can fix it. Thank you, Faisal. Um, you know, this is not a new issue um, about nourishment in long term care homes and the fact that the amount that they give in an envelope uh, for meals to be provided, nourishment meals, nourishing meals to be provided uh, to, our, to our elderly, to our loved ones in long term care is not sufficient. Um, it's been deteriorating. Uh, there's been articles written about it, about how uh, there's not fresh fruit and fresh vegetables. Many of it's processed food and frozen uh, vegetables. And many times it's, it's also that long-term care homes um, don't even have the kitchens where their dining room is. And one of the things they say is that the smell of food helps you know, your saliva, your, your, your desire to enjoy that food. And so it, the last increase from what I recall was um, it back in 2014. Again, a small increase doesn't compare uh, to the comparison that they're making in, um, in the corrections file. Uh, so it needs to uh, be changed. And, you know, when you think about for profits and you think of, gosh, all those shareholders like a Mike Harris at Chartwell, you know, sitting on the board part time and getting, you know, over $180,000 to sit there and to know that, uh, you know, they could take some of that, they could take that, that those profits and put them back into care and better food value um, for your loved ones is furating, really. And so we absolutely agree that there should be uh, well balanced meals, uh, you know, quality meals, because we know that also e equates to better health for people. So under our platform, we do talk about cultural sensitive approaches and homes uh, for long term care. And that would also uh, include, you know, different food varieties, because that's another thing they say that patients or residents, excuse me, who are uh, have dementia or Alzheimer's, if that meal, it's the food reminds them of their past and it actually helps them, it, it, it help, helps their well being. So, those small things are huge when it comes to quality care, when it comes to quality of life, and even if it even helps the workers in the, in the work environment. Um, you know, so I agree with you. That is, if, if that is what seniors, and we know that that's what they're getting, um, isn't adequate to provide a proper meal uh, for a senior that meets their dietary requirements, then we need to look at that as well and examine these things. And it's it's not just a one size fixes all, but there's so multiple uh, layers of how we can fix things, but there are you know steps that we need to take um, in order to get there. But certainly taking the profits out of care and, and people demanding better meals, that's where the some of that funding should be flowed into as well as our personal frontline workers in long-term care because we know that that isn't happening and families are are so grateful for what workers do but there's just not enough of them um, so you're correct i i agree with you that the meal quality needs to be better you have people living there as their home and when you're at home you know, you take comfort in the basics, you know, that's the way you're treated. And in this case, you're the way you're treated by workers and how many workers there are and the care they give. So we need to have that four hours. And then also by the food and the surroundings. And, um, you know, I, I'll say it again, the NDP talks about our vision for long-term care in the future, and as well as is 
making homes smaller so that people aren't being warehoused and institutionalized. They, we have smaller home-like settings um, in those places where people can age in place gracefully and then, you know, have that quality of food and have that quality of care. Thank you. Paula, would you like to add uh, anything? Or? Just briefly, because I, I, I realize there's probably many more questions. I just want to add the because I see this as an opportunity in terms of the dialogue and and um, in educating people about long-term care for-profit structures. You know, the, the dietary envelope and the housekeeping envelope are their profit envelopes. Exactly. Any money, the money that comes in the nursing envelope, if they don't spend it, it goes back to the government. So of course it's always spent, but the housekeeping environmental envelope and dietary envelope goes back into their pockets. It is part of what forms the millions and millions in profits. So even though the food amount of money has to be spent, how they prepare that food takes staff. And you can't prepare quality food without it, enough staff. So they end up buying bags of food um, that gets to be a pr a processed food that's be able to cook quickly and put on the table quickly um, and put into their bins quickly. So it cuts on staffing. The dietary aids in these departments, the, um, there is some full-time workers without a doubt, but the vast majority of employees are part-time working three and four hour shifts. And they run from one kitchen servery area to the next one to serve um, this this food. And I feel very badly because I, they've been kind of beat up recently on social media, uh, sort of blaming them. And I know people don't mean to be because we all know where this is coming from. But the fact of the matter is you can't actually put a really good meal on the table with people working three hour shifts. And, for, to not, and there's not enough cooks, registered cooks in the province to actually to like certified red seal cooks. And these are all things that are tied directly to profit and not to be a broken record on this, but if we wanna see change in these areas, we have to take the profit out of care. Um, and I'll leave it at that. I agree, I agree. And people's parents and grandparents have been left to, to get sick and die alone in, in horrible conditions. We must never go back to the way things were. We need a plan for better aging. And by, you know, as this says, uh, the age 40, 20, 46, people aged 65 and older will make up close to 25% of Ontario's population. As seniors get older and many will develop dementia or chronic conditions like diabetes, arthritis, and many will experience multiple health conditions at once. We need them to focus and invest more on on not for profit, but more services and programs to support our seniors. Um, I would just want to just read before we go to the next question, uh, unless you want to add something on the previous question. If not, I will just um, read your comments. So first, we'll finish the questions of folks uh, that have registered. And folks are saying, uh, Tracy Brown says, go hope. And our hope union makes us proud. And I'll just go quickly, the comments. Um, Government home is not for profit. Make all long-term care not for profit. And um, and also says uh, uh, that was um, Arlene. And Arlene says again, what I would like to see, BSWs get decent living wage. And that, that's a very good point. Uh, excellent uh, for that. So those are, more comments are coming, but I'll just, um, uh, uh, quickly finish those registered questions so that we will come to you uh, for your comments uh, fully and you are also questions, those of you who are engaged discussions on Facebook Live, Faisal Hassan, NDP. And uh, the, the next question comes from Kira and says, why is there no ratio of nurses RBNS to resident limit? Why do you only a lot for six minutes of care per residence in the morning. Why is there only attention on long-term care homes during a pandemic? Why have you not listened to us, healthcare workers, begging for help? 
for the past decades. So basically this question is, surrounds the neglect of the previous conservatives and liberal governments. I'll uh, just to start with uh, Teresa. And, and of course, uh, that's a very good point. Um, and we're asking that same question. Uh, now people are even more aware of it. Why was the, were these things allowed to happen um, before now? Why wasn't the care, the quality of care there? Um, why was it acceptable as uh, the, the, the person pointed out that people are getting someone out of a bed who is uh, maybe have cognitive development, uh, de dis co cognitive issues, um, possibly obviously very fragile uh, person, um, healthcare issues and having to get them ready at six minutes in the morning. Like that isn't even um, something anybody can do who's in good health. Brush your teeth, you know, wash, uh, fix your hair, um, you know, wash your face, get yourself dressed and then head to the breakfast table. But yet that is the standard that we expect for uh, PSWs to help our very frail loved ones. So the, the time to care addresses that. And um, there is the RNAO did a study on it and they broke down um, that, that call for a four hours of minimum care legislated and they allocated as um, 48 hours of RN. So that's registered nurses uh, per resident per day one hour uh, of RPNs uh, care per resident per day and 2.2 and hours, which is about an hour and a half um, or two hours, uh, point, sorry, 2.2 hours of PSW per care per resident per day. Now this study um, was done uh, some time ago and that's saying, you know, this is the kind of uh, population uh, we have in the long-term care homes. They're very complex needs and they're coming in more, more elderly and they're coming in with uh, more health issues. So having that four hours of care pass into legislation and to Paula's point is where are we gonna find these workers? Um, I have to say workers have, and she, I'm sure Paula knows too, have left the sector because of the working conditions. So if we can entice people back and it's just not saying you can have now a better working condition, you get four hours, but where's that pay increase to show the value for work that they're doing to looking after our loved ones. So again, in our platform, we're looking to the future and we're saying we need to assess all wages of uh, long-term care teams in homes and we starting off by saying that PSW should have a $5 an hour bump up and full-time jobs where, you know, proportionately to the, to the uh, workforce um, because it's not acceptable. And the fact that we now, there's no excuse that governments, and I hope it's not a liberal government. I hope it's not a conservative government. People are tired of having their, issues brought forward. And these are humanitarian issues now, right? These are humanitarian issues with food quality, um, you know, people to the point where there's crisis, they're passing away. Workers are getting sick. There's not enough workers, they're exhausted. Um, and, and it's gotta be done. And there's no more, um, you know, delay. There's no more opportunity to say that it blame this government, blame that government. Look, look to the future. I, I say to everybody out there, look to the future. And how would you want to spend your uh, wonderful golden years in a long-term care home when, you, when you're transitioning out of home care? First, we want to make sure home care is strengthened so that if everyone who has the opportunity to stay there does. But when that time comes and you're transitioning into long-term care, how do, you want it, how do you want it to look? And that's what we have a vision for having smaller homes be, uh, between six to 10 people, making it culturally appropriate, paying people better wages, um, you know, having tr staff that's trained in geriatrics, because that's, again, if we collect that data, we know that that population is gonna be a tsunami. So I, I thank you for your comments and you're right. It shouldn't take a pandemic for, for leaders to have that will to look after our most vulnerable and, and compensate the workers that do that really, really important work in our society. Thank you. And uh, Paula, would you like to, to comment on that as well? The same question? I'd love to comment on it for about four hours. But I think <laughs> <laughs> Teresa okay. did a fine job and I think there's more questions. So we should probably let, let other people have their questions. 
Very good. Well, thank you. And uh, those of you who are commenting and asking questions, we will come to you. But I would like just quickly finishes uh, those questions that have already registered as we've asked them to register. Uh, we'll just give them a priority on that. Um, and also a question comes from Sonia Duzura and says the, the death of, 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 of seniors during the pandemic in, in healthcare system is, 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 is not, it is horrible, you know? What can we done to correct things? I think we've been talking about um, those actual things, the mechanisms of how to correct those problems as we've been discussing. But I hear you um, that, you know, people want to hold someone accountable for these horrific um, deaths, right? They want to do that. And uh, what has happened is when you do have these for-profit homes, there's not the transparency and the accountability. And on top of that, what the government did um, most recently is pass Bill 218, which basically sets the bar of negligence uh, so so hard for, for someone who's suing for them to meet, that they're gonna get away with, um, you know, if they had good intentions and they uh, had, um, you know, goodwill to do these things, to actually hold them accountable for negligence in a, in a long-term care home is gonna be very difficult. And that's what experts were saying during those committee consultations. So, um, you know, if you're looking um, of how to hold somebody accountable, it, the legal system has been watered down of how families can do that uh, in the long-term care facilities, as well as even the government to hold them accountable. Um, but, you know, if we go to make changes and we want to see that this stuff doesn't happen going forward is we need to make real changes as we've been talking about um, the quality of care, having full-time staff, paying good wages, taking profits out of home, making homes smaller. Uh, so they're home-like settings, have culturally appropriate um, uh, homes and also make it uh, one of our colleagues Lisa Gretzky has passed a bill to more than just a visitor where you have essential caregivers are allowed to go into the homes and because they do provide that well-being that of care they're not replacing the professionals because that's a whole skill set in its own but what they are is they're you know they're sitting with their loved one and giving them a little bit of lunch or having a cup of tea you know helping them wash a little and that's just a tender family thing it's not replacing the professionals by any means and families don't want that they want to still continue that emotional bond that they have a relationship with their loved ones um but but if you're looking, like you say, to hold someone accountable, the culpability for these deaths, uh, the government uh, has basically passed legislation that that is not going, it's going to be very difficult to do that for, uh, for families. Well, thank you. And also our colleague from uh, um, uh, Waterloo, uh, Catherine Five, also brought a bill about uniting uh, the couples and families together rather than separating them. So that's also something uh, we're proud of that as well. Um, Paula, quickly. I, I just want to add really quickly, and we've said this already a lot, mm. but the best way to fix the problems and hold the for-profits accountable is to change the government to a government that will hold them accountable. Mm. Because to date, that has not happened. And this pandemic has given them more rights instead of less rights. And it actually has been very disheartening <laughs> to watch what has just happened because I, I've always said to our members, you know, once the family members start complaining, this will get fixed, right? They don't care what the workers have to say. They care what the families have to say. Well, now the family's voices have been shut down by that legislation that stops them from suing. And not stops them, but very much weakens their rights. Um, and that's a really bad, bad thing. Yeah. And the way to fix this is to get rid of this government and to elect a government that's not going to sit on their hands and blindly watch it go on and on and on and on for 15 years while they continually cut funding. Because that was the other part of what's been a problem is the funding loss to this sector. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. And we need to stop the privatization of it, which the, the last 15 years has also been part of this. And we need to make it things better. And NDB government will make sure that we remove the profit out of the uh, long-term care 
uh, for, we, we owe it to our seniors, uh, definitely. And hold on, your comments, I'll come to you, your comments, folks uh, joining us live, Faisal Hassan, MDP. I'll just to finish it, uh, uh, those questions quickly. And we have um, another question uh, from those who have registered from Rocklin verse best, all long-term care and health workers must be receiving pandemic pay in this pandemic working stage. And we know that this is a very good question, but we know that majority of them have not been paid for the pandemic paid. Uh, who would like to go first? I'll let Paula go, because you probably have heard <laughs> a lot from your, your workers. Yeah. So I understand that the government chose to do a three, this pen, this portion of pandemic pay, the $3 that has been paid out to most PSWs. Some, some corporations still have, have not rolled it all out or the retro for it. Um, and they did that because they knew the second wave was coming and they were terrified that the PSWs would leave the sector again, like they did in the first wave. So they wanted to make sure that they had a financial incentive to stay. But the fact of the matter is every other human being in that building, and we aren't just seeing PSWs with COVID positive tests, we're seeing housekeepers, RPNs, RNs, dietary staff, RSAs. It, this, this, um, this virus doesn't care what your classification is. It's, a, it's attacking everybody. And everybody is working more than their share of work and everybody is at risk. And, and every single person, regardless of the pandemic in those buildings deserves a wage increase. I mean, we've got housekeepers and dietaries across Ontario earning minimum wage in these homes. We've got um, PSWs earning uh, in, agencies, in agency environments and in retirement homes earning minimum wage. In long-term care, the wage is just barely above minimum wage. So you're quite right, a $5 wage increase for PSWs is required, but it's required right across the board. How, why would anyone, and, and, and Teresa, you mentioned this before, people are leaving the industry in droves. Mm -hmm. And another study that was done by the ministry, in fact, uh, during the pandemic, it started before the pandemic, but they released it just a little while ago, 25% of all new PSWs leave in the first two years. So we aren't, so as people get older, which this industry is very old because Mike Harris basically built it up starting what, 20, 25 years ago mm -hmm. through the liberals. So those PSWs that were 20 are now 45, 50, 60. So they're, they're retiring and they're retiring in droves, but there's no younger people coming in to fill those spots. And, and that's because their mothers and their fathers are saying, well, it used to be a good job. It used to pay a decent wage and you had benefits and sick time, even though it was very hard work and, and physically stressful, but now it's all part-time and you work like a dog. And I think you should go into some other sector. And so the ones that do go in 25, 25, that's a ridiculous amount of people who are not staying. And what's left is, these, this workforce that's between 45 and 65 years old who are physically exhausted, they're aging like the rest of us, and they just can't keep doing this work. And that pandemic pay not only should be going to everybody, everybody, it should be going to everybody at the end of this pandemic because if had they been paying it in the beginning, a lot of people would have stayed in the industry. That's all I have to say about that. Absolutely, you're right. And that is why, and also the Premier says in many occasions, these are frontline heroes, he calls them, and they are indeed uh, frontline heroes, but he has to support them. And just talk is not enough. We need action and also spend that $6 billion that's sitting there uh, earmarked for COVID uh, to um, uh, spend and support our frontline workers and our heroes. Uh, the last question, those who have registered, we have come to, and it comes from Charity. So Charity says, would, would it have smarter to give the vaccines to people who are going into homes first, as they are the ones who are bringing the virus into the homes, as our seniors do not go anywhere in the first place? But they have already been affected, though. I mean, our seniors are dying in large numbers, so we have to save them in the first place. Um, 
So, uh, Teresa, quickly. Yeah. So quickly, I mean, I'm certainly not a medical expert by any by any stretch of the imagination, but I I would say that vaccinating uh, what the phase one is doing because we we've or the fa phase one vaccination um, plan. Uh, going to long-term care homes and retirement homes who are in hot spots and have more risk, um, absolutely that should be done. And we should include residents um, because they are very frail and, and they're very um, vulnerable to this virus and the outcomes are horrific. Um, whether you know one group should be over the other, I, I leave that up to the, the public health um, medical officers to determine. Um, but I definitely um, having the most vulnerable population because we know the death, no the numbers of the death toll is is horrific, right? And and it's got to stop and it's got to be fixed. Um, on that quick note, though, I have to say that um, because the numbers have faces, they're people, they're our loved ones. Um, I did bring in a bill in. It's uh, to recognize the third Monday of every month. Uh, it's called COVID Memorial Day, so that we don't forget. Um, yes. that this thing that this happened I mean SARS happened and people you know so long ago but we need thousands of people are dying and I, I hope there won't be any more but we've seen now like I say seniors 3400 and then even more um, and we and I think we need to take the time as a province as a government to understand that there are people who grieved and they grieved under the worst conditions imaginable. They weren't able to be with their loved ones. They weren't able to have those celebrations. So, um, you know, I, I put that bill forward, hoping that at least that'll be something we can have a day. We can all just pause and remember that this is the kind of uh, thing that happened to families and loved ones and workers had to go through and workers died on the job. Um, but we don't want that ever to happen again. Thank you. And uh, uh, Paula? Just really quickly, I really also think that I agree with what what Teresa said, and I certainly wouldn't want to be the person who would pick who what what group gets it without just basing it on science and public health. But I will say this: the rollout of this vaccine has been ridiculous and appalling. Yeah. We found out today the stats aren't even correct that only half of the vaccines that they said were being delivered have been delivered, and there's absolutely no reason that we are like worse than Donald Trump. Like we are at the very bottom of the major countries that should be able to roll this out in a way that um, is moving much quicker than it is now. By now, all of the long-term care facilities and retirement homes should have been done and the employees. And there, I have no understanding of how this could have been so bungled, um, again, knowing that this was going to happen. Like this wasn't like, oh, this someday we might have a vaccine. We knew we were getting vaccines. We knew it would happen. There should have been a plan. There should be a distribution plan or a better plan. And to find out today that we've been misinformed and that half the vaccines weren't really actually given to human beings, um, it, it's appalling. And I just think that uh, we have to really, really pressure this government to give itself a shake and, and do the right thing and, and make sure they, 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 you know, both federal and provincial, by the way, we have to get this done and it's gotta be done better than what we're doing. Thank Absolutely, you. I fully agree. The complete failure of this uh, Ford uh, Conservatives failure completely, uh, you know, and what's coming out now, it's also really needs uh, an inquiry to look into this, uh, to find out exactly what's going on because we owe it to our seniors, we owe it to the people of Ontario. We come to the end of the questions registered, but we have tons of comments and questions of folks joining us live on um, Facebook. So I'll just go quickly and then um, and make sure that we will um, include everybody, you know, to just uh, also, you know, also with the, with the interest of time also, we will also watch on that quickly. Um, Danny says here, it's a long comment. He says 96% of all COVID deaths have been in long-term care homes. Yet uh, we we all got punched in together regarding uh, the Raconian protocols based on failed model. Um, uh, even uh, this is a specific demographic. We all got the same protocols. And what's killing them is the fact, he says. The abuse of isolation tactics, anyone dealing with the COVID and recovering cannot be isolated as the stress and the high level of anxiety and depression kills. 
These are facts, he says. Yet now, this immune, weakened, sickly individuals are going to be given a trial experimental vaccine on an immune compromised community. Uh, this is insane. This is criminal, he says. How can this be done and why? Let's address these factual uh, based questions. Well, that's a, that's a comment, um, but I think uh, as, 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 as uh, my guest said, I think we're relying on signs and the doctors uh, to make those decisions. Is anyone would like to comment on that or would, uh, should I continue the next? Okay, very good. Well, thank you. And um, Joel, uh, uh, I think I've read that one already. Frank says here, the, uh, the uh, facts of the long-term care COVID issues is black and white, false. The determine of the death, uh, survival of COVID. There are many people, uh, both young and old, who are suffering the aftermath of COVID battle, breathing issues, circulatory issues, uh, amputations, uh, incubations, is life altering. Statistics often leave out middle ground of COVID-19 infections. That is just a comment uh, again. Uh, and then Arlene uh, uh, says, uh, I agree. And Tracy Brown says, go home. And um, our hope union makes us proud. Janet um, writes and says, um, what can be done now to protect those who have not contracted COVID-19 before they get sick? Well, maybe um, should, should uh, I mean, um, what can be done now to protect those who have not contracted COVID-19 before they get sick? Well, exactly what I will say, Janet, is uh, sell, uh, make sure that you Practice a social distancing, wear your mask. Is everybody practicing social distancing and making sure you're following, um, you know, um, protecting your neighbors, yourself? I guess you will continue to stay healthy, you know? I, I hope that is the way to go. Uh, making and sure then hopefully wait for that vaccine who is it's taking too long for, you know, every that wants one to access that's we've heard it's going to be delay upon delay uh, which is not comforting to those people um, who want to have the vaccine beyond uh, the phase one as we said with long-term care and the workers and um, the general population it's uh, who knows when that's coming there's no there's no timeline for that 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 they can commit to um, so it's um, you do what you can around what you said Faisal yeah. um, but those that want the vaccine, they're saying, you know, it, it's just been a debacle not to have it rolled out in a way that uh, we had so much time to plan for it. Absolutely, and that's right. And I think this is the, this government's um, uh, just just letting us down again and again. What we need also, Janet, is also wash your hands. Make sure you know you also uh, uh, protect your family by following, you know, those. Uh, uh, public health instructions and so forth. That way will make you healthy and stay safe. Um, I'll continue the comments. Um, uh, Erlene says, government home is not for profit. Make all long-term care not for profit. We agree, an NDB government will just do that. Remove the profit out of uh, the uh, these long-term care homes. And that that's the way to do it. Um, uh, thank you. And then Erlene says again, um, uh, what I would like to see PSW get decent living wage. I think that's a very good point. We have uh, talked about it. Uh, anyone would like to talk more about that quickly? Um, or we, we did actually devote it some time uh, uh, um, for the previous questions, um, Erlene. And then John says again, uh, uh, can homes go back to preparing food in each home and get away from the processed food? I don't know exactly what Jen means there, but she says, can homes go back to putting food in each home and get I away from processing um, um, uh, food, start from? I didn't understand clearly that. Um, we'll go to the next one. The lives of our seniors have been devalued. When the people you care for are devalued, the workers are also devalued. This is Joyce Plus saying that. And uh, we agree, yes, we have to really uh, make sure that you know we are respecting our workers, especially uh, frontline workers who are uh, our heroes, and not giving them their pandemic paid is a shame. This government exactly says so much contradictions. They say they're heroes, and they are not consistently paying them uh, the pandemic pay, or raising them, or hiring more 
we called for 10,000 BSWs to be hired. And uh, Joyce um, says again, yes, Theresa, small, real homes. And uh, Joyce continues again, supports need to be tailored to challenges of the people in these small homes. And I'll just continue reading your comments quickly uh, because we didn't give time early on. And uh, Vince uh, Lobrano says, you are so right, Teresa, a, a, a long-term care home is a home and should be a safe and secure home for seniors who live there. And Joe says again, why is, is it that people believe that it is okay to warehouse people institutionalized model of care has proven to fail people. Why haven't we learned from history a guest? Because we have been electing conservatives and liberals consist consistently. We need change. An NDB government will, will bring that to an end. Absolutely. We don't have to go back to liberal conservative. You have an option. And the option is here. Uh, um, um, and Arlene says, absolutely right. And, and then uh, Joyce continues, profits being pay to see CEOs and shareholders suck money out of the system uh, instead in reinvesting into the system. Uh, Joyce again says, um, uh, the current system of warehousing seniors are certainly not homes. If they were people would be happy to go there. I haven't heard of any who is enthusiastic about going to a long-term uh, facility. And this is, again, uh, Joyce continuing her comments. Uh, people need to understand that there are over 3,000 people under the age of 65 in long-term uh, facilities. And uh, why is it that the people are okay when they hear someone says it's okay, they're going to die anyway. Uh, this really demonstrates the devaluation of our seniors. Indeed, we have to respect our seniors and that means we have to really make sure that we change the policies uh, um, in go our government. Instead, she says, we should be treating our seniors who help build this great country with respect and dignity, not abuse and neglect. And then Frank says, it is because those people don't care. They don't have to see them interact with them or look after them. Joyce says again, um, small community-based homes with no more than six people would help reduce uh, the risk of spread of any infectious diseases. And Joyce continues, uh, says, uh, I think they put blinders, bl blenders on so they are, don't have to deal with this. Now, Tracy Brown says, how can the government say three PSWs aren't short? Well, feel terrible when we can't get all our tasks done. We are building cars, we are looking after human beings, is this so unfair to our residents? And Karen Louise Court says, in order for BSWs to get $5 an hour wage increase, you need to get rid of homes for profit and, and, and stop paying the management companies and CEOs millions and millions per year. I fully agree with you, um, Karen. And Joyce continues, she says, funding needs to be attached to the people, not a bad. This way, the allocation plus the co-payment could be used to house three people in a, in a condo with support staff that provides continuity and allows the building of relationships which assist with a, a feeling of belonging, respect and dignity. It is easier to care for the three people, uh, the, uh, three people than 40. This would raise the profit, uh, uh, the profile rather, it will raise the profile of the care workers. Um, Tina Kalamadi Nolan Roy says there should be a ratio for BSW to residents. And Joyce again says, imagine if our seniors could be in a small home where they could actually smell their food cooking, plant gardens, stroll in their own garden instead of having processed food put in front of you, walked along uh, uh, halls or facilities or be in locked word because uh, you have uh, dementia. Um, the comments continues. There's a lot of comments here. Uh, Joyce says again, yes, people write uh, your MPP and demand the bill uh, two or three more than a visitor be passed immediately. Uh, we agree. And um, Tracy Brown says, uh, how can government say three PSWs are not short even with three? We struggle to get our task done and take good care of our residents. 
We are not doing, we are not building cars. We are looking after human beings. They deserve more of our attention. This is so sad. I feel terrible when I go home knowing that some residents didn't even get to the toilet. This is wrong and needs to change. That is a Tracy Brown and we agree and change is coming and NDP government will make that change permanent. And Joy says here, yay, let us, let us all remember that in 2022, it will be up to all of us to make sure that people don't forget. Unfortunately, so many more people will lose their lives between now and 2022. And, the, uh, and Joyce continues to say, them, the administrators are circumventing the single home working directive by using temporary agencies. This highlights uh, the risk of COVID getting into the home. Many of these uh, workers are untrained. Um, continuously, I'll just pass uh, the, give other people a chance. And Tara now, what is the realistic expectation of eliminating for profit long time? And how would the NDB begin this process? Well, that's a, a question. I'll come there quickly. Uh, Tara Merachin says, um, what is the realistic expectation of eliminating for profit long-term care and how would the NDB begin this process? Maybe maybe I'll turn to Teresa on this quickly. Yeah, absolutely. So what we're saying is that we need to start um, looking at taking profits out of long-term care. And that starts with any new license that people apply for must be, um, non-profit licenses. So stop issuing new license for for-profit and issue them for not-for-profit. Um, one contract comes up for for-profit home providers to renew that we don't renew them um, in a for-profit setting. We, we actually start transferring them to uh, public not-for-profit uh, homes. And then also start a transition process um, so that we can have transparency under financial reporting and accountability for the for-profit long-term care homes um, and set up a system that as uh, we do have this transition that there is management going in there to change it from a for-profit to a not-for-profit. And we need to do that and redirect um, our public dollars towards uh, public not-for-profit homes to, uh, so that they're including funding for refurbishing and rebuilding and, uh, and legislate to prohibit uh, for-profit long-term care homes from closing uh, their beds during transition that they have to stay in there until we can take them over or if there's a new, uh, if the renewal of the contract then we then transition um, there as well. So we have had um, that plan is in our Ontario NDP, a seniors care plan. And it talks about how that um, system can be transformed from a for-profit to a not-for-profit uh, uh, long-term care home system. Good, there you have uh, Tara. And uh, I'll just, um, I think most of the questions are just repetitious. So uh, Jen says the kitchens in homes used to make their own food before it was cheaper to bring in food and cut staff. And Joyce Blas says, Faisal, you made me laugh. I'm happy that I made you laugh. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, those are the, all the comments that folks have joined us live from uh, facebook.com, Faisal Hassan NDP. And I know we have come to uh, close to the end and uh, definitely I will, if there's any other comments come in, we will be able to to include, but I'll just give, um, um, to thank uh, my guest, uh, and I'll just give them an opportunity to, um, opportunity to have uh, concluding uh, remarks. Uh, um, and also if you have any also opportunities, all those comments that I've just read, if there's any reflections, anything you would like to also elaborate or speak to, um, please do so. And uh, whomever wants to go first, it's okay. I'll start since we've been doing that from the beginning. It's, uh, we're a little over time, so I'll, I'll try to be uh, quick and short. Um, I think it just uh, shows tonight the kind of interest and appetite that people have for change. And as we said, um, there's more, more and more groups, uh, more and more, uh, even experts like the humanitarian doctors, uh, humanitarian doctor uh, movement, where over 200 doctors signed on for changes to long-term care. You know, I, I have to say, you know, I with the workers, as as um, Paula said, you know, workers have been telling us this. I've heard it. I've heard it from family members as well. 
But until the public outcry and there's an outrage, then that's when this government seems to really pay attention. So we have to keep that pressure up. And that's by contact your MPP. That's by going on social media. Um, I'll plug my time to care 100 days on February 5th social campaign. Um, that's engaging in virtual um, uh, meetings as we're having. And that's also engaging your own neighbors and community and keeping them informed and continually um, bringing this up and don't let it go away. Because in the past, I know what, what had happened was when, when there was a tragedy in long-term care, media covered it and then it was quiet. You know, you didn't hear it again until something else raised. Well, you know what? We're not going to let this go away. We are, people are fed up. It's, um, you know, it's a bittersweet because obviously what people are going through and workers are going through is horrible. But the fact that it's come to light and it's come to this and people are not going to, uh, you know, allow it to stop, to continue to happen. They want it to stop. Um, so I just say, you know what, please, everyone uh, pay attention to 2022. Uh, look at what you're voting for. Go to our ONDP, um, our site. We have our platform for housing. We have our platform for seniors care. We have our platform for climate change. And we're coming out with our more of our, our plans. And we're doing that ahead of time so people know who we are and what our values are. Um, because oftentimes our platform, our ideas get confiscated <laughs> by other parties and they claim them. And that and, and it, we're tired of that. We're, and we're running for government. You know, Andrew Horvath wants to be the, ne the next premier and we need to make that happen so we can actually, um, in the context that we're talking about, protect our seniors in our long-term care facilities. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, Paula? I want to start just with, with, with saying um, ditto to everything Teresa said, um, but also I really want to reiterate, reiterate the the need for us to stop calling people frontline heroes and essential if we aren't going to recognize their dignity, their pride, their spirit, and their hard work. And not just through the fact that they all need to be paid like they're heroes and essential, they need to be treated like they're essential. They need to be provided the dignity in the workplace that we all are, should be afforded in Ontario, Canada, and, and in this world. Um, and that, of course, goes towards the residents too. I'm not just solely advocating on behalf of the workers, but it's a trickle down. If you don't have enough staff and if, the, and if you don't have happy staff or staff who aren't exhausted, never mind happy, they don't even want to be happy. You know, people aren't just fed up, they're appalled. They're appalled at the conditions in long term care. And I'm really hoping that this dialogue that has finally got started, as Teresa said, and I think I said earlier as well, you know, for over a decade, this dialogue has been ongoing, that if we continue to, if we don't, if we don't continue this dialogue through to 2022 and elect a government, which I believe will, can only be the NDP because the Liberals have proven um, that they had 20 years, they had almost 20 years and they made it worse. Um, it's my saying is liberal, liberal Tory, same old story. Yes. Um, <laughs> we have to make a change and we have to make a real change. And that starts with all of us continuing to not just put pressure, but to educate and to talk to people, not just the gals and, and our friends in the lunchroom. We need to be talking to other members of our family. We need to be talking to everyone who is now appalled. Everyone who is saying, wow, this is terrible. Have you seen the food and long-term care? We need to be explaining to them the funding structure. Why is the food bad? You know, when they hear about um, residents in retirement homes being left in their beds by themselves when the you know, the story in Hamilton with Rosalind where, where a resident was left in his bed overnight where the whole building had been evacuated and, and taken to hospital. We need those stories to be continually talked about so that we can stop the carnage and create a, a, a system that um, does what we're supposed to be doing, caring for people, caring for not just our most vulnerable, but the are most important, caring for our memories, caring for the people who have have brought us to where we are. So I really, really hope that these um, 
town town halls continue across the problem. I'm really hoping that uh, the you know, people who have participated and the members of HOPE who I've seen your names on the screen, um, you, you go back into your workplaces and, and not just talk about your working conditions, but the conditions by which we got here and how we have to how we have to educate our families and friends to make change. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Teresa, and thank you to Paula. Uh, thank you again for joining us, uh, folks. Uh, uh, this evening, I want to thank my colleague, Teresa Armstrong, Member Provincial Poet uh, of uh, the London Franchise and the official opposition critic for long-term care for uh, her hard work and advocacy on these issues. And um, I, I would also like to thank Paula Randanza, President of HOPE, um, 2022 to 20, 2220, for joining us uh, this evening as well. The problem with long-term care in this province ran deep and the fixes will require more than just a tickering. We must overhaul the long-term care and home care system into something that works for, for our people, regardless of how much money is in their bank account. To accomplish this, we need a new public and non-profit system where every dollar goes directly to residents, not to corporate profits. Thank you again for joining us this evening. And also remember on Saturday, you can also join me, uh, bring your coffee and tea and join me at 3 p.m. to hear your concerns and your issues. And I do it every Saturday to hear the community's concerns. And this is also a way to also be you know, transparent uh, and to also have access to you to come and uh, join me then. Until then, thank you. Thank you to Teresa and thank you to Paula. And thank you um, uh, for those of you who have joined us, those we have read your comments and those we have not, um, 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 we thank you again. And those also who have registered their questions, we thank you as well. Well, until then, thank you and, uh, and see you. Bye. <laughs>